Okay, so we are here with Alex Rodriguez. Hello. Um, so yeah, could you just first say a little bit about yourself, how we met, and um, yeah, and just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm Alex Rodriguez. I am a ensemble member at the FSU Oslo Conservatory for Actor Training. Uh, same ensemble as Kenny here. Um, I remember really distinctly the first time you and I met. We were our first day in class, I think for movement class, and we were paired up and um, there's like was a moment of staring into each other's eyes and like seeing like the universe and soul that resided in each of us and um, from that moment like you know there's a familial connection that you have with all of your ensemble members but um, that's that's kind of what I remember the first meeting of you and it's been a journey ever since three years of you know growing together and learning and turning and all of that since we're talking all about that what like what would have been some of your um for all of the people watching, um, you know, no one has really talked too much about what the experience is like of grad school. Mm. Um, for you, like, what, what has your experience been and what do you think grad school is trying to deliver? Hmm. Um, you know, I feel like these past few years, I've kind of come to the conclusion that grad school just puts you in a very hot situation of trying to accomplish so many things but not being able to and then how you manage on the way is is the lesson in some way um i have a lot of feelings about education especially in terms of like artistry i think if anything going to grad school is about learning how to communicate with other people who maybe don't think the same way you do in terms of artistry and being able to work together and grow together differently but as a, a unit and I think that is one of the strongest lessons I learn and continue to learn in the act of being in an ensemble. Um, so these three years have been challenging, but rewarding for me. I, um, I mean, especially, you know, with the pandemic and everything, it, it, it's been, it's been a lot of changes and a lot of adaptation and I'm grateful for that. I am, um, you know, yeah, yeah, for, for you. Like, what have you learned about yourself as an artist um, that you didn't know coming in? Uh, so that's part one. And then part two, how have you changed during the COVID time? Mm. I think every artist, like, has their season of gaining and losing faith in self. And I feel that I came into grad school with little faith in self and and leaving with a strong lump of faith, as our uh, wonderful professor Andre would say. Um, and I think that faith resides in not necessarily like knowing you're really good at something or, or knowing you're better than other people at things. It's more of really recognizing yourself and embracing that and being okay with that. And such a hard thing to do and it's a daily practice but um i feel that my time here has kind of taught me to to be okay with that ebb and flow and also like constantly keep a sort of optimism that you know after winter will come spring and summer you know um and I'm sorry, what was your second question? Yeah, well, oh, how I've changed because of uh, the pandemic. Has COVID been a winter or a spring? I think in the grand scheme of it all, it I've been very lucky and been able to flourish during this entire year. I mean, I I always like remind myself like at the end of the day I'm in grad school to you know be an artist 
during one of the greatest like catas uh, catastrophes of our people and what a gift and like yes i feel guilty about it but also like i feel blessed in certain ways and and i feel like this is in a way the work of it's even more important now to understand people to understand yourself to, to listen to your body to listen to other people and tell stories because we are have never been more distant from each other and and so it, it really almost feels like a call to action for me um so i i feel i have changed and that my purpose feels more defined or urgent and my gratitude is so much stronger. I feel like I overuse that word now, like I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, but it's true, I am. And you know, if that's a, a mantra for me to have, then like, that's, that's lovely. Um, yeah, there are many worse ones. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So yeah, and I mean, I feel like I have a lot of like secondary relationships that have suffered because of this, like people who I can't see very much anymore, but I think my primary relationships have strengthened and um, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that, you know, to be able to move through all of this with people who I love. And also, you know, I, I'm sure everyone has a similar feeling of like when it all started and when lockdown began, that feeling of just absolute dread at night, trying to like go to sleep at night. And I'm like listening to NPR at like two in the morning and stop just like trying to make sense of it all. And that dread is just such a feeling, but there, there became a moment at some point where I realized, oh yeah, the world has ended. The world has ended before. It will continue to end. And we are still here. And I think that's a story of resilience. And even though we are like tested, I think that's part of the human experience opposed from everything remaining the same forever, you know? So you are very deeply an artist and um what what was the soil that you kind of grew up in that cultivated this kind of artistic want or this i don't know pull pull towards the arts mm -hmm. what was your upbringing like i mean i think it's similar to any child of the 90s you know there's it just was a good time to be a kid you ran outside and you really relied on your imagination and and I, I feel like a lot of the generation of my parents are the people who said, I'm going to give my kid a really good childhood. And I think that had its ups and its downs for a lot of reasons. Like if anyone's a millennial, they kind of know like where they're at right now. But I think we were given space. I was given space to, to imagine and dream. And I really kind of never let that go. Um, for me, I have an older sister. She's about five years older than me. And so, like, you know, th that's like a big enough gap in age where when her interests become different in terms of, like, middle school and I'm still, like, a little kid wanting to, like, play in the dirt and stuff. So I had to rely on my own uh, faculties to to not be bored and you know like I'm sure a lot of people have this but my mom would be like all right you're out of the house don't come back for a while like go go play go do something don't be in this house you're annoying me <laughs> and so like I would just be running around outside and like finding good sticks and like chasing squirrels and like playing these huge world games in my head and I think that's something that I still long for and, and I'm trying to reach every time I make something. What were some of the blocks for you growing up? Um, what were some, some challenges? Yeah, well, I think 
I so I grew up in rural Midwest, um, a small town in Illinois, and so I think like there is a a culture that that you kind of have to fall in line with in terms of like being um, a guy, and you know when you grow up in certain social dynamics, it's like you are ought to behave certain ways. And for me, I was always accused of being a very sensitive person, which I am. And, you know, like, of course, when I was really little, I would be the one who would like, one thing went wrong and I would start crying. And people would be like, stop being sensitive. Why are you crying? It's not a big deal. Which, yes, it's, it's true, but also I think it was a struggle to kind of find that line of how much of showing my emotions or feelings is allowed. And um, I think everyone struggles with that, but I think actors, artists, it, it's especially hard to, to really understand like how to move through life when you feel so deeply about a lot of things, you know? For me, I, it's hard if I'm in a room, I really pick up other people's emotions or energies. So like if, if someone's having a really bad day and they're in my proximity, I will, I will kind of soak it up in a not always healthy way where I'm like, now I'm having a bad day or now I'm feeling distraught. And it's like, learning the tools to not let that harm me, but also reminding myself that that's a, a gift and not something to like work or get rid of. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just, just listening to you. And so, you know, something that, that we talk about, I talk about a lot on this channel is strength as vulnerability. Mm -hmm. In, in your opinion, like, that philosophy, like, what, what are your thoughts of that? Strength is vulnerability. Um, yeah. I think that is so true. I, th I think someone to own their experience fully in their body, in their, in their like, logical understanding and in a spiritual way is for me the like that's the sweet spot that is that is the goal to be completely not in control of but in experience of yourself um, and that is vulnerability it, it is allowing your full you to be permeated and and experience the world around you um for me i i always have this like really silly concept which i don't even know if it's a concept it's just a thing that i think of late at night that like our brains are these supercomputers that have made all of our bodies and sensory stuff to to be able to make sense of what is around them because right now our brains are just in dark little rooms, you know, and like sp spitting out all this stuff. And so our brains need feedback to understand what is happening. And we, they like want to know so badly for survival, but also just for curiosity. And I think we are doing ourselves a disservice if we block our receptors or our different probes that we have from feeling fully. And of course there's some things we don't want to feel like. I don't need to know that fire is hot. Like, <laughs> I, I know, I know, but, but it is a vulnerability and it's a trust. And I think it's not something that can be 100% on all the time, but it's something to um, work for. At least it's something I work for. And, you know, part of why I, I want to be an artist, a, a theater maker and storyteller is because I think if I can do that and have people see me do that in some way it will help them yeah um, what is some advice 
that you would give your former self? <laughs> which which version of myself? <laughs> well, well, yeah, which versions come to mind? You can give. Um, yeah, you can give that's many a great steps. question. I would say, trust yourself, love yourself, take more risks. I think those are the big ones. Are there any parts of your story that you would like to share that we haven't talked about? There's so many. I mean, so many years of experience and thoughts and lessons. Do you have one or two that come to mind from childhood or from adulthood that you'd like to share and maybe give some advice about how you processed it? Hmm. The first thing that comes to mind is um, our uh, Shakespeare teacher, Johnny, talks about how like what, what the role of a director is or a teacher is. And, and he said that some people need, feel as if they need permission to, to fly, as he would say. And a director's job is to give them permission if that's something someone needs, you know. He says in an ideal world, he, there wouldn't have to be a director giving people permission. Um, and I feel like that's something that has always kind of been settling within me of like how do I give myself permission to do things that I'm afraid to do um, I remember looking for programs I wanted to go to for undergrad and like having a conversation with my mom so I was going to be a graphic designer um, and like I was hoping to get some sort of like theater minor or something somewhere and every program I went to they were like yeah you can't really do that like that's too much work and you know it's just not gonna not gonna work and I just remember like talking to my mom being like I, I just I don't know like I can't I can't imagine like not being able to do theater and stuff and then she just like looked at me just like then why don't you major in that and in my head I was like oh I could do that you know and I think in the back of my head, I needed my mom to say that to me for me to be able to do it. I needed like a blessing or I needed permission to follow my dream. And I'm always wondering like, if I didn't have her who was understanding and loving and like supportive, what my life would be like and it, it makes you wonder what are the parts of of your life that would be dramatically changed if you would have been given permission and so like for me i'm constantly working on How, how how do I give myself permission to move forward? And also, you know, being aware of other people as well. You don't want to be an asshole who's just like, I'm doing this, I'm taking this, you know. But, like, what is that line? Hmm. Any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> So many thoughts. I feel like I could talk to you forever. It's like such a could listen to you forever. Yeah, you're a great. You're a great listener and uh, converser. Is that a word? Yeah, I'm grateful for you. Um, I'm grateful to share my thoughts. Grateful, Jesus. It's always <laughs> grateful. Yeah. It's great that you're unconscious of it now. Yeah, you know? I, yeah. It's it, good. It, it just <laughs> spouts out. Um, no, I mean, unless you have any other questions or, like, follow-up questions. Um. Well, I find it, you know, I guess I find it interesting that, um, that, your, that the story did not include um, your sexuality and coming out as gay. And I guess I, I'm interested in that section of the story 
and I'm also interested why why it was not included, why you didn't include it without me asking. Hmm. Yeah, I thought about that. I, I, I knew I knew when we were having this conversation that like it might come up and it is interesting that it didn't come up. I, I'm really on so I've been looking for monologues for days and it's been very stressful because I was like I'm trying to find monologues that both best best fit my identity. So I'm like, okay, I'm looking for a half Mexican, half white male identifying person who is gay and and like very specific to that and not trying to like take on identities that aren't mine. Impossible to find. And in looking at like a lot of the plays with gay characters and the content for me I admire the stories being told but I also feel like they're not a full story. It's always a gay person entire character has to be about them just being gay and their like sexual preference. And so it's like if this person's gay then he's going to be having sex and talking sexual and like doing the whole like, you know, kind of caricature of, of what it is to be gay. And so maybe like because that's been in my mind for a while, I might have subconsciously left it out of the, of the beginning of this um conversation to kind of just like be like this is it goes deeper than that you know but but that's just definitely it is part of it and I think for me that was that's a, a paramount part of my my journey of giving myself permission and being okay because that was something that I eventually had to just give myself and of course I had the help of you know my my mentors and my, my boyfriend and my friends and stuff, but it's hard. It, it's, it's really hard. It is something that is part of that daily struggle and practice of like saying it's okay to, to be a thing and seeing where you sit in all of that, you know? For me, for me, I struggle with identity of, of being one thing. And it's part of being an actor where you're like, I can, I can be anyone. Like I, like I see someone on the subway and I can like identify with them somehow, you know, but, um, yeah, like to say I'm gay and to say I am half white, I am half Mexican. And that was such a struggle growing up, too, because it was like, I always remember only having white friends, but I was, like, categorized as the Mexican of the group. But the um, people in, in my school who were Mexican didn't want anything to do with me, you know? Like, they would speak Spanish around me because they knew I couldn't speak Spanish, and... I, I played soccer one year and was so bad at it. I was so <laughs> bad at it. I hate the sport. Like, I know, I know. And like, You're those fast, were. Though. You are fast. Yeah, but those were the things that, like, kind of, like, m made those groups of people, like, um, that was a common interest that I just didn't really have. And, and like, my house culturally wasn't necessarily rooted in my heritage like I, I've really I really struggled especially as an actor because you, you act you talk about your um typecast and so for now like I'm looking for monologues and I'm like I don't want to I don't want to say a monologue that's for just a white person but a monologue that's just for a Mexican person isn't right either and you know I was just on this film and um this uh, woman who played my mother, she's Puerto Rican. Um, she was like, "Honey, you 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 look too brown to not speak Spanish. You have to learn Spanish." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my God, that was like really mean, but also I really need to hear that." <laughs> um, um, and it's just so interesting because it's like different people see different things from you. Um, 
and yeah, so I think that is my my struggle at the moment of like, what am I? What am I? <laughs> mm, mm. Or and you know I don't know I feel like at the end of the day like to give yourself a general label while nice and comforting at times is not always the most helpful thing because we can be multiple things very complicated things um, I kind of lost where I was going with all of this um, well I I'm. <laughs> Looking now, like at, at the kind of macroscopic scale of how our country and our culture deals with diversity and intersectionality, yeah. what do you think our culture is doing well, and how do you think it can improve? Well, I, I think like we. It sucks right now. It really does. But it's better than it has been in a lot of ways. And it needs to improve in a lot of ways. I think, if anything, uh, a gift that we have is the ability to, to speak and say, I am here. I matter. Now, getting people to listen, that doesn't necessarily always work. But... It, it's happening. It really is. And, and the um, representation is happening, even if it is slowly. I like, I'm always interested whenever I go back home because my parents still have cable. So like when I like see what's on cable, I'm like, whoa, this is like <laughs> the commercials and stuff. And, and like, I remember seeing a, something like a Christmas Target ad and uh, RuPaul was in it in full drag and I was just like oh like what <laughs> and like my family's just there watching it and I'm, they probably didn't even know that was RuPaul or anything but it, it's just like wow that I can't imagine that being a thing five years ago yeah, ten three years ago, three years ago yeah. absolutely ten years ago and it's just like I think in order to continue to move forward with progress, you have to recognize progress that has been made and, and continue to fight for change, but also rest and, and celebrate victories that, that have come. And I think that needs to happen like, that needs to happen. So for me, like, being someone who's gifted with so much privilege, you know, I, I am, for the most part, white passing, you know, I am, for the most part, straight passing. I was born a male and, and identify as male. Um, and, and... I'm trying to, you know, navigate myself where I live with all my other things that are, you know, maybe not necessarily fit within the world that has been constructed for me. But, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm great, grateful for my gifts and my privileges and I hope to use them to continue to improve myself and help support and elevate people who maybe are not able to do that for themselves. For the people out there watching, this will be the final point. Yeah. Like, how do you think people watching can help do that for others? Telling stories. The hard ones, or the really funny ones, or, <laughs> you know. The ones that you're constantly reminded about. Again, talking about Johnny, you know, our professor, he always says, like, what is the story you want to be told? And then, like, what is the story that needs to be told? And to ask yourself that every day is, uh, it's important, you know? Because we are, I think, 
told the same stories all the time. I think some aren't as helpful as they have been, or there's some that maintain a sort of status quo that is overused and kind of worn. So I would um, invite people to ask themselves, what are the stories I want to be told and what are the stories I can tell? And then do that. Or listen for them, you know? And, and I think that is a way, a way, if anything, for us to better understand what it means to, to be here. And that's a good start. <laughs> that's a great end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks.